at KBI's Play Your Song Academy. Today we'll be learning about how to take care of our cello and bass. What we'll be learning about is the parts of our instruments, what not to do, setting up to play, posture, keeping our instrument safe, and all the cool accessories you can get for your instruments. Today we have a special guest here to teach us about our instrument. His name is Luke Gray. Luke is a KBI lesson instructor. He teaches and plays many instruments, including the violin and the bass. He's also an instructor at FAME, the Fredericksburg Area Young Musicians Homeschool Group. He also plays in many different genres of music and groups in the Fredericksburg area and beyond. So we're going to start with the parts of the instrument. There are quite a few of them, and we will be making reference to them as we go along, so we need to know the names. Starting from the top, we have the scroll. Kind of looks like one of those ancient scrolls you'd see the Greeks using, you know, in the olden times. It's got that nice spiral shape to it. There's no real practical purpose to it. It just looks nice. It's one of the visual qualities of our stringed instruments. Beneath the scroll, we have some more practical bits. We have the pegs here, and the pegs go inside the peg box. The peg box is kind of where all the strings are wound, you know, they go around and around the peg, and they make it nice and tight so that the strings can sound what they're supposed to sound like. We don't really want to be messing with the pegs unless we have to. Below the pegs in the peg box, we have the nut. The nut is also a very important part of the instrument. The nut is basically what makes it possible to make that happen. If we didn't have the nut there, it would just sound like blah, 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 make no sounds at all. Beneath the nut, we have this long black part. We call this the fingerboard. Fingerboard, because that's where our fingers are going to be. Behind the fingerboard, we got the neck. The neck and the fingerboard are attached right here, as you can see, this long, long, long line. And the neck is basically going to be where our thumb and our fingers go behind while we're putting our fingers on the fingerboard. Going down here to the lower part of the instrument, beneath the fingerboard, we have the bridge. Kind of looks like a bridge, that's what we call it that way. The, bread, the bridge is kind of like the nut in that all the strings are placed on top of it, which makes it possible to play the strings like that. If the bridge wasn't there, we'd have no sound because there's no tension. On either side of the bridge, we have these F holes. They kind of look like a cursive letter F. These are very important because this what really helps project the sound out of the instrument. And then we have this long black part down here. We call this the tail piece. Tail piece is important because this is where the strings are attached on the other end. They're attached on this end with the tail piece. They're attached on this end with the peg. Inside the tailpiece, we have these fine tuners. The fine tuners are great because they make tiny little adjustments to the strings if it's just a little bit out of tune. And then the tailpiece is wound around our end pen. And our end pen is going to be super important for us cello players because if I just put the cello on the ground here, it's much too low. I'd have to like lean over and it's going to be much more difficult to play. So I would take this out to whatever height is needed, and then it can go up to proper playing position. So now that we've talked about the parts of the instrument, let's talk about the parts of the bow. There's a whole lot less to remember, thankfully. So let's start at the bottom here. We have the screw. Screw is important because we will literally tighten it or loosen it, and then the hairs will either get further from the stick or closer to the stick. We go from uh, the screw over to this next silver part. We call this the ferrule. The ferrule is kind of what keeps the hairs safe and guarded inside here because the hairs you know, wrap inside of here to make sure that they don't explode out into all different types of directions. We go from here to this long black part. It's a little bit tough to see, but you can see it's a little bit fatter than the rest of the bow. We call this the grip, which obviously is where our fingers are going to be gripping so it doesn't accidentally slide up and down. This bow doesn't have it, but your bow might have some silver winding 
around the bottom as well. It's one part visual, looks nice, but it also adds a little bit of extra weight down here at the bottom of the bow. You'll notice that your bow is weighted in very, very specific details for much more advanced things later on. Now, the obvious part is this long white part, which are the hairs of the bow. These come from the tail of the horse. And then, of course, the bow stick, and then they meet up here at the tip. The tip is the most fragile part of the bow, so we want to be very, very, very careful up here. All this metal and whatnot down here is very, very durable, so this is where we do most of our gripping. So those are the parts of the bow. So we've learned the parts of the instrument. Now we're going to do all the never-evers that you want to be remembering for your instrument. So one thing you want to be very, very picky about, these things up here. These are the most dangerous parts of the instrument because if you twist them too much or you don't, you know, twist them enough, then the strings can do some nasty things. They can either go completely flat or completely wobbly, or they can actually literally snap. And if they snap, they can, you know, shoot out pretty fast. So only let your teacher or your local luthier or music shop adjust with these because we don't want any accidents to happen. The next safety thing you want to be careful about. This is not a chair. You never, ever, ever want to sit on this. Cellos are pretty durable. They're pretty, uh, they're pretty big and strong, but they're not designed to sit on them. So they can very easily, at the least crack, at the most, they will literally explode. Since this is a pretty big instrument, it's going to be very easy to bump this into things, primarily doors. You want to be very, very, very picky when you're going through doorways because it's easy to bump it into the left frame or the right frame. So usually when you're going through doors, it might even help you to kind of twist it sideways. That way you can you know, fit through it better. If you have a hard case, you might even need to like lift up the hard case to bring it over instead of just wheeling it on through. So be very, very careful when you're going through doors with cellos because it's very easy to bonk into it. The next thing is we want to make sure we never ever leave our cello in the car. It's usually not a good idea to leave any instrument in the car, but especially a wooden instrument like a cello. Even if it's like an even temperature where it's not hot or too cold, it's just not a good idea to leave, it, leave the instrument in the car because glues what's holding the instrument together primarily so if things get too hot or too cold you can imagine some nasty things are going to happen with the instrument and then lastly we want to try to keep liquids away from the instrument as much as possible so you know keep it out of the rain obviously you know if you're doing some cleaning or washing around your house you probably don't want to be doing it around the cello maybe keeping its case at that point but if ever we spill something on the cello or it gets wet in any way, definitely dry it up as quickly as you can. Hopefully you haven't done any damage at that point, but we want to try to keep the instrument as dry as possible. We talked about the never evers with the instrument. Let's talk about never evers with the bow. The number one thing you want to be careful about with your bow, the hair is very, very clingy. The hair likes to grab hold of things. So we try to keep our hands away from the hairs because you never know what bits of dirt or skin cells or what might not would be attached to your hand, which will then cling to the bow and it'll make your bow hairs pretty dirty. If your bow hairs get pretty dirty, it's not going to perform very well. So we only want to be touching the bow by either the stick or by the frog. We don't want to actually touch the hairs. Now, I mentioned earlier that the most fragile part of the bow is the tip up here. So we never ever ever want to lean with the bow. We don't want to use it as a cane. We don't want to use it as a stick. We don't want to lean up against it. We never ever want to, you know, poke anything with the tip. The bow is used for music. It's not used for fighting. So do not think that this is a sword and swing it in anybody's direction or against a stand or against anything. It's a musical instrument. It is not a weapon. And then lastly, 
We want to always be holding the bow by the frog. If we accidentally hold it by the tip, it's kind of awkward, it's weighted weird. We're probably going to drop it if we're not too careful. So only ever hold it by the frog or by the stick. So we talked about all the things you shouldn't do with your instrument. Now we're going to properly set up our instrument so we can start playing. We're going to start with the bow. If we go down here, we're going to use the screw now. The screw is what makes the hairs go tighter or looser. We want to tighten it so that we're ready to play. So I'm going to give it a little bit of a righty tighty and you're going to see the hairs and the stick start to separate a little bit. If you look right down the middle, you should have about a pinky length of distance between the hairs and the stick. Some people like it a little looser, some people like it a little tighter, but that's about what you're looking for, a pinky length. Once it's tightened up, we are ready to rosin our bow. Rosin is what really makes the string stick to the hairs, so we want to always make sure that we apply the rosin to the bow. <clears throat> if you are already pretty well rosined and you just want a little bit of upkeep, you probably want to do this method, which is a nice even coating from the far of the bow to the tip of the bow. It gets a decent amount on every single part of the hair. Probably all you need to do is like 20 times or something like that. Now, let's say you have a brand new bow and you put it to the string and it makes no noise. Well, you need a lot, a lot of rosin. So what you do is you do this method. I'm rubbing every bit pretty hard, pretty fiercely. I'm creating a lot of heat, a lot of friction. That way the hairs and the rosin will connect a lot better. Now, I'm all rosined up. Let's go ahead and show you where the instrument is supposed to be. We're gonna start with the end pen. The end pen needs to come out at a certain distance so that when it's on the ground and it's wedged in between our knees, this bottom peg should basically be poking me in the ear. It's not quite going to be poking me in the ear, but it's going to be pretty close. So right there is a pretty good height. This bottom peg's poking me in the ear. Now, if I grab my bow, I don't need to reach down or reach up. My hand just naturally falls right here where I naturally want to play. Now, you're probably going to start playing and you're going to find out immediately whether your strings are in tune or not. You're going to play them. Right now I'm perfectly in tune. We're good to go. You might find that, oh, one string sounds a little bit low or a little bit high or just off somehow. If it's just a little bit off, then you can twist these guys a little bit to hopefully fix the problem. You're probably going to need some kind of tuner just to double check to make sure you're doing it in the right direction. Or you might unfortunately find a situation where one of the strings is just completely off. Like it's like almost completely wobbly, making no sound at all. That means it's completely loose and we need to twist the pegs a little bit to tighten it. Now, I highly recommend, unless you have been playing for a long time, to take it to a music shop, take it to a luthier to make sure that they do it properly. Because if you don't twist it properly, number one, it's going to be pretty hard. Number two, you're in danger of accidentally snapping the strings because of all the tension and all the, the tightness that the string is underneath it. And if you snap a string, you're going to have to go to them anyway. So it's a good idea to go to them first. So we've set up our instrument and now we're going to kind of talk about how we play a little bit. So first things first, whenever we're playing, we always want to make sure we have good posture when we're playing. So up near the edge of your seat, feet flat and always with a straight back. We never want to be playing back here because then it just makes it tough to reach things. So good posture whenever we're playing. Now, talking about the bow hold. The bow hold is a little bit more complicated than what goes on right here. Make sure you always talk to your teacher first um, because they might mention something a little bit different than what I talked about depending on the bow grip or the instrument hold. And definitely do what they say because they probably, you know, can fine tune it to your body shape, your arm length and whatnot a little better than I can. 
So here are the guidelines I like to follow for how you're supposed to hold the bow. So I like to kind of keep my hand pretty similar to what it wants to do actually. See how the fingers are pretty close to each other? You know, they're pretty equidistant. I just kind of let my hand fall on top of the bow like that, almost like I'm hanging, almost like I'm just falling down a little bit. And my hands naturally kind of fall where they're supposed to be. These two fingers kind of protrude down a little bit further than the bow. My middle finger is touching the silver ferrule. My ring finger is right next to it. Your bow might actually have a little dot on it. If it does, your ring finger should basically be covering up the dot. And then the pinky finger goes flat up against it like that. We don't want it to be up here. We want it to literally be hanging over the stick. And then the first finger just kind of wraps around that grip a little bit. And then lastly, the thumb. We don't want the thumb to be over on this part of the bow. We want the thumb to be literally on the stick, right underneath the grip, actually. There's like a little bit of space in between this little bump of the frog and the grip. That little bit of space is where I like to wedge my thumb. That way it won't move. And always make sure we have a little bit of a bend in the thumb while we're playing. And that should hopefully kind of make it so that we have a lot of weight with our hand so that we can get a good sound when we pull the bow across the string. The bow grip's gonna take some work, it's a little confusing. The cello just kind of goes boom, right there, we're ready to go, but you have to kind of work at the bow grip a little bit. Now, we have four strings we need to remember as well. From low to high, this is something you have to memorize. C, G, D, A. It's very, very handy if you come up with a, a, a phrase or a sentence to help you remember that. I like, you know, creative goats do aviation or something like that to help you kind of remember what they all are. So it's very important we memorize them. A lot of what we're going to be doing with reading music and playing music kind of, you know, jump off those open strings. So once you got your instrument planted, once you got your bow grip confident, then you're ready to start playing. Now, there are some differences in the playing position and posture between the basses and the cellos. The most obvious difference is the bass is positioned a little bit more to the left than the cellos. The cellos is it's kind of in between the legs, bass is much too wide for that, so we kind of lean it against the side of our body. What we're looking for is this edge on the right side of the bass, the back right side, should be wedged on the inner thigh of our left leg. You can even kind of let your left leg come out a little bit so the bass can kind of lean back against it. Because if I have my foot in the proper position, it'll stay up without me needing to manipulate it. Now my end pin is already set. The nut of the instrument should be right at about eye level. So you might need to bring it down or up a little bit to make it properly sit. Bass end pins are usually a little bit different than cello end pins. Cello end pins are a little bit more uh, smooth. Bass end pins usually have little notches in there to help it kind of stay in place a little bit more since the bass is a little bit more heavy. Once it's in position, some people like it lean, some people like it straight up. You want it so that when you put your bow to the string, it just lands there properly. You don't want to hunch down to make it happen. You don't want it to be way too far up here. My hand just naturally reaches the string when I put my bow to it. My hand naturally reaches the string when I want to pluck it. So, our instrument is set up properly. Now we need to kind of figure out how we're going to play. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to rosin up our bow. Our rosin is different than the other instruments. Violins have their light rosin, cellos have their dark rosin, we have pops rosin. It's got a little bit of extra oomph because our bass players need a lot of extra grip. As bass players, we tend to play down here near the frog more because we need a lot of weight, we need a lot of oomph to start our sound. So when I'm rosining my bow, I like to give a couple of extra rubs, a couple of extra repetitions just down here, and then I'll do the whole bow a couple times. And while we put the cello and the violin, going in one direction tends to give a nice even coat. I like to just go both directions. Bass players need as much help as we can get to get that big sound. Even when we get the big sound, our sound is so low, sometimes it just doesn't carry over the higher instruments. So a lot of rosin, 
especially a lot at the frog. Now be careful, bass players. This rosin is very meltable. You know, that's not really a word, but this rosin melts very easily. So make sure you keep it in good temperature locations. So our bow is rosined, but wait a second. What kind of bow is this? This is a German bow. Bases are unique because they have two different variations of bow. This bow and the more common bow, the French bow. The French bow is basically held the same way as the cello grip. So if you look at the cello portion, follow those guidelines, you should be good to go. The German bow is held a little bit differently. We're going to put our thumb on top of the stick. We're going to lay our first finger straight down the stick, kind of like I'm pointed straight down. And then our pinky is going to be rested on the silver part, that ferrule. If you want a little extra grip, a little bit extra power, you can kind of let the two middle fingers go inside this little gap. If you want to be more relaxed, you just kind of let them go in line with the other fingers, and you should be ready to play with the German grip. The German grip is pretty easy. That's why I tend to gravitate towards it. When our bow is ready to play, my back is straight, my arm is straight, I don't need to lean over to get the bow to go over here. We're ready to play. So we're done playing and now we have to put everything away. So first thing most people do is they immediately loosen their bow. So we're going to go down to the screw and we're going to lefty loosey. You're going to immediately see the hairs in the stick are going to get closer and closer. Right about the point where the hairs in the stick touch is where we need to stop. You're going to start to see the hairs kind of come apart a little bit. That's totally fine. As long as the hairs aren't getting super, super far apart, you're good. If they got super far apart, you loosened it too much. So right about there is pretty good. Sometimes you might find that there's some rosin on the actual stick part of your bow. You can definitely take a cloth and, you know, wipe it off if that gets to be too much of an issue. So we're done with the stick and now we got to put the cello away. First thing we're going to do is we're going to retract the end pin. Make sure it's secured in place. You don't want to accidentally do this and then the end pin falls out of the instrument. So you might have a hard case or you might have a soft case. Most of the time a hard case is going to be easy because you're just going to put it in the slot, you strap it into place, put the bow where it's supposed to be and you're good to go. When you have a soft case, be very, very, very picky that you don't accidentally put it in backwards because then it's going to be a tight fit, it might not even fit at all. And when you're using a soft case, make sure you put the bow in last. If you put it in first, it might get crumpled, the, the, the case is very, very flexible, so something bad might happen to the bow. So we always want to put the cello in first, the bow in second. Now, before we put the cello away, we usually want to take a cloth and wipe off our instrument because you might find that bits of rosin are starting to cling to the string and they might even start clinging to the body or the fingerboard. So you'll just take a cloth, wipe here, wipe under the string, wipe the body, just to make sure that things are looking nice and clean. If they stay on there too long, they actually might actually physically start sticking to the instrument and it's just not gonna look very nice. So we've loosened the bow, we put the end pin in, we put the case in. Make sure we only ever put the cello and the bow in the case. We don't want to put extra things in the case. Most cases have pockets or something. If you need to put a little something extra, like a book or an accessory, tuner or whatnot, but the actual end part of the case is just for the cello, and it's just for the bow. The last thing we're going to talk about are the accessories and extra things that almost every musician needs, regardless of the instrument. So every single stringed instrument needs some rosin. As a cello player, we have to be very, very, very picky that we choose dark rosin. Because we have thicker strings, longer strings, we need extra grip. We need a little extra oomph to make sure that the string sounds its best and the dark resin can really, really help bring the sound out a little bit more because it catches the string a little bit more as well. Every stringed instrument needs a cloth. 
As I was saying earlier, rosin can sometimes build up. It can build up on the string, it can build up on the body. Sometimes it can even build up on the bow. So we want to make sure that we have the cloth that we can wipe things off. And sometimes just dirt and dust can accumulate. Cloths are helpful for that. It's usually very, very helpful for most people that carry a backup set of strings. Most likely your strings are not going to snap. They're probably not going to break, but you never know. Something might happen. You want to have a backup just in case. And strings need to be changed about once a year, depending on how much you play. So it's good to have some just in case so you don't have any awkward moments where you can't play because the strings are too old or the strings are broken. Mutes are also important for musicians to have. Sometimes when we're playing in an orchestra, the music literally tells us consornino, which basically means play with a mute. So you stick these behind your bridge, put them on top of the bridge, it kind of you know muffles the sound a little bit, gives a slightly different tone. If you're having trouble with your bow grip, you can order some bow buddies, and those can help you kind of figure out where your hand is supposed to be on the instrument. For cellos and even for basses, sometimes when we put the in pin on the floor, it slides around and it's it's tough to kind of keep things stable. So we have what are called rock stops for that. These little things are really nice because they have like a little cup where you can stick the end pin in and then you tie the other end to the bottom of your chair and that way your end pin will never ever move and you can be nice and still and stable. Now every instrument needs a tuner. This is a nice clip-on tuner. It works for most instruments. It tells you exactly if you're too high, too low. You know you can get tuners basically anywhere and in any type of situation. You get them on your phone. You can get actual devices that also have metronomes and whatnot. But tuners is a must for every single instrument. And then of course music stands. The last thing you want to do is be doing this sort of thing or doing this sort of thing when you're playing and then you know that ruins your posture. So having a music stand so that you can put it in a proper place so you can have proper position is also very important. Thanks for watching today. If you have any questions feel free to email us at info at kbimusicshop.com or call us at 540- 891-7800. Our staff would love to help you out. Also, check out our website. It's www.kbimusicshop.com for a PDF of this video's information and for all your musical needs. Let us help you play your song.